we tend to think when we go to quit about how short we are of our goals. And what we want to do is shift to what's the progress that we made along the way. If you're climbing Mount Everest and you turn around 300 feet from the summit, you failed. Because goals are like really pass fail, right? But you didn't fail. You climbed 29,000 feet in the air, which is like a lot more than most people did. And so one of the things that I try to recommend is like, first of all, think about when you're walking away from something like, well, what have I achieved? And what are the things that I've learned along the way? But then also, it's really good to prioritize projects and goals where even if you don't make it to the ultimate goal, there's a whole bunch of learning and achievement that you could take out of it. Like things that aren't so all or nothing. Business casual. The word a quitter can sometimes leave a bad taste in your mouth, especially when it comes to your career or big life goals. But the truth is, we all quit things. Whether it's a job, a relationship, a habit, or the 10th push-up, I have quit every job I've ever had in favor of new careers. I quit the trading floor to work at a startup. I quit that startup to work in TV anchoring, and then I quit TV anchoring to start my own thing and host this podcast right here. Granted, I always quit out loud, nicely, and with enough lead time for my teams to prepare for my absence. And our guest today makes the case that quitting including your ability to quit most effectively and knowing when to quit, is a decision skill worth developing. In her new book, Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away, former professional poker player Annie Duke makes the case that learning how to quit will help you make better decisions under uncertainty, something we all face at one point or another. For example, she notes that success doesn't necessarily lie in sticking to things. It lies in picking the right thing to stick to and quitting the rest. I mentioned that Annie Duke is a former professional poker player. She won more than $4 million in tournament poker before retiring from the game in 2012. And knowing when to quit was a key strategy for those who dominated the sport. In her words, amateurs usually hold them, professionals usually fold them. Annie shared some important red flags, signs that tell you it's definitely time to quit, and how to avoid doubling down on something in the face of bad news or signs that it is not going well, which research shows we tend to do. And she tells us why, when you do decide to quit, you shouldn't necessarily be quiet about it. This conversation will change the way you think about quitting and success, and hopefully inspire you to put your time and energy into things that are truly worthwhile for you. Annie, I have so many questions for you. I am, I'm a okay. big quitter. I've quit every Good. one of my jobs I've had, and we'll get into that. Yeah. First, let's start with a quick icebreaker. This is for a segment called OG Occupations. So Annie, what was your first ever job that you've ever had? Not counting babysitting, counting any count everything, it. counting anything, whatever you can. Well, I mean, your my first, first job. job was babysitting, but my real first job mm-hmm. was at Kentucky Fried Chicken when I was really? fourteen years old. Oh, yeah, How brown polyester <laughs> slacks and like smock situation. Wow, it was uh, yeah, it was something. I don't have pictures of it. I wish I did. I'm a big KFC fan. Did you enjoy it? Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, did I enjoy? <laughs> Memorizing what goes in a three-piece box. I don't know. <laughs> some sort of life skill, I'm sure. <laughs> That's amazing. I like the mashed potatoes, which looking yes. back is a little is a little embarrassing. A little sus. They're maybe. powdered. But <laughs> at 14 years old, I thought they were delicious. I know. I used to love the coleslaw so much. Yeah. Um, okay, let's get to quitting. Uh, the word quitting obviously comes with a negative connotation a lot of times. It implies you've given up, you've been defeated, but that is not your stance at all and I agree with your stance. First of all, what exactly do you mean by quitting in the context of your book? So, you know, yeah, so I think, first of all, you're absolutely right. If I called you a quitter, I would be completely insulting you. I mean, I wouldn't, (laughs) but you would take it as an insult Mm -hmm. because I'd be calling you a loser. Um, But it it shouldn't be that way, right? Like, we want to change that. So, you know, I think that one thing that people need to realize is we think about quitting is, is one is a particular thing which is like stopping some large thing um so like you're in a job you quit your job but there's all sorts of small acts of quitting that we do all the time Mm so um like you're watching a tv show if you decide that it's not for you and you don't watch the next episode or you stop in the middle of an episode that would be quitting if you um are managing a project at work and you decide that that's not 
the right project for you to be doing in order to reach your goals, that would be quitting. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's like there's you, we have to think about you know what I think about is you can like change directions that would be quitting or you could exit the court mm-hmm. and that would be also quitting. But there's also other things that go under quitting like if you change your mind if you abandon a belief. So I used to believe that Pluto was a planet, but now I don't. So that's a form of quitting. <laughs> if I fold a hand in poker, I'm not getting up from the game, but I'm giving that hand up. Mm-hmm. It's called cutting your losses. That would be a form of quitting. If I sell a stock, like selling things is yeah. a form of quitting because you're quitting your ownership. And if you fire someone, it's quitting. We just have a different word for it because as an employer, if I let somebody go, I'm quitting that employee, employee relationship. So it's really covering basically any kind of situation where you started something and then you decide that you don't want to be on that path anymore. Mm-hmm. A change in course. And you say it's yeah. a decision skill that is worth yes. developing. Why do you think quitting is a skill in itself? So I, I actually think it's like the decision skill that you need to develop in order to be a good decision maker. So the reason is that when you start things, you're deciding to start it with very little information. And then also the way that that thing turns out is going to be partially like luck is going to have a huge influence over it. So if you think about most things that you start, like imagine that you're taking a job or even that you're hiring somebody. So let's say I'm hiring you for a job. Mm -hmm. What do I really know about you? Right? Like I've got a CV. I've had a few interviews. I've got a couple references. But I actually know very little when I enter into that relationship with you and that's true pretty much of all decisions you know that we have to make in terms of starting things so there's this huge influence of uncertainty and I assume Nora that you've had that feeling after the fact of saying like oh I wish I knew then what I know now Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's that feeling of like you just don't know a lot when you have to decide to start something so this is why quitting becomes really important because when you have that feeling of I wish I knew then what I knew now You actually have a way to address it, Hmm. which is to take on the option to quit, right? So I found something new. I wish that I had done something different. And, but, you know, so I can and I can quit. And there are a lot of forces that are working against us when it comes to making that decision to quit, cognitive forces and otherwise. You talk about something called the escalation of commitment in your book. Mm -hmm. Explain what that is and why that works against us. So, okay, so we have the intuition, and I think you do too. Like, so I assume like when you start something, whether it's a job or relationship, or maybe like you make an investment or whatever, I bet you have the intuition that when the world gives you signals that that thing isn't going as you had hoped, that you'll pay attention Mm -hmm. and you'll stop doing the thing that you were doing before. so that, I think that's an intuition that we all share. Yeah. But there's decades and decades of science that shows that not only, not only do we not do that, but we escalate our commitment to the cause when we get bad news. So I think one of the, um, one of the best ways to see that is actually in war, right? Like think about mm-hmm. the Vietnam War, for example, or the war in Afghanistan. You know, you start it and then things aren't going well, right? It's very clear you're not gaining ground. The war isn't going as you hoped. I mean. You know, Vietnam War, I don't think there was any point where anybody thought we were winning that war. And what, yet we stayed in it for a really long time. Because even though you're getting this information that if you knew it at the time that you were thinking about starting, you wouldn't actually start. Like, if you knew it's going to be 20 years later and this is going to be our situation, right? Right. Um, you probably wouldn't have started that war. But when you're in it, once you started getting, you know, accruing losses and having all that stuff happen, you actually tend to escalate and increase your commitment to the cause and it gets you stuck in stuff. And mm-hmm. it's like not just wars, but it's also like jobs and relationships. This also reminds me of the sunk cost effect, which you also write yeah. about, which I, you know, I think everyone's pretty familiar with that. But can you apply the sunk cost effect and the quitting mentality to say, accepting mistakes or bad situations that seem to have absolutely no upside. And and I say this from personal experience because if there's something bad that's happened to me and I walk away from it, I try to think about what lesson did I learn? Is there a reason for this to have happened? There is there some benefit that I've gained versus, you know, this bad thing just happened? So how can you use that sunk cost, sunk cost mindset to get over something bad that's happened and, and not just in the quitting scenario? Yeah, so just for people who aren't familiar with sunk cost, it's just basically like once you put time or effort or money or attention into something, 
uh, it becomes really hard to quit it because you, if you quit without actually having achieved whatever the goal is, you'll feel like you wasted all the time mm-hmm. and effort and money. Um, so you can kind of see that with, say, the Vietnam War, right? Like once you start to have casualties and you've spent a lot of money on it, people say, well, if I exit before we've won, then those the lives that we lost will have been wasted. Mm-hmm. The money, you know, the taxpayer money will have been wasted. But the problem is that that t- waste isn't a backward-looking problem. It's a forward-looking problem. And this addresses what you're talking about. Like, how do you actually get yourself out of this? Mm-hmm. And it's to think, you know, is the next life that I might put at risk worthwhile? Or is the next month that I spend in this job actually going to get me what I want? Or is the next month that I'm going to spend in this relationship worthwhile? Because what you don't want to do is say, you know, this re- the relationship is not at all what your hopes and dreams were. It's not aligning with your values. You're really unhappy. You don't want to stay in it because you don't want to have wasted all the time that you've already put into it. What you don't want to do is waste the time you're going to continue to spend in it. Mm-hmm. And so it's weird because, like, that way we think of waste in a backwards way makes us waste going forward. So that's, like, the first problem, um, which kind of is, a, you know, a, a way that you have to change your mindset, you know. But a second thing that you can do, which you alluded to, is that the other problem that we have is we tend to think when we go to quit about how short we are of our goals. And what we want to do is shift to what's the progress that we made along the way. So, like, I mean, you know, right, if you're climbing Mount Everest and you turn around 300 feet from the summit, you failed. Mm-hmm. Because goals are like really pass fail, right? But you didn't fail. You climbed 29,000 feet Mm -hmm. in the air, which is like a lot more than most (laughs) people did. And so one of the things that I try to recommend is like, first of all, think about when you're walking away from something like, well, what have I achieved? And what are the things that I've learned along the way? But then also it's really good to prioritize projects and goals where even if you don't make it to the ultimate goal, you're, you'll, there's a whole bunch of learning and achievement that yeah. you could take out of it. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Like things that aren't so all or nothing. And there is preparation that you can do ahead of going into a new task or a new job. You highlight something called kill criteria. So some practical guidelines for kind of overcoming those negative assumptions about quitting. What do you mean by kill criteria and how can we start to come up with our own? A really simple example of a kill criteria is um, when people are mountain climbing, they have something called a turnaround time. So uh, when you're going up Everest, let's say on summit day, and you leave Camp 4 to go head toward the summit, the turnaround time is 1 p.m., uh, which means no matter where I'm on the mountain, it doesn't matter whether I made it to the summit or not, I have to turn around at 1 p.m. because otherwise it's too dangerous because that means that I'm going to be coming down the mountain in darkness and mm-hmm. that's not good for anybody. So that's a really good example of just a very simple kill criteria, right? I'm going to start, if it's 1 p.m., I'm going to turn around. Mm-hmm. Super simple. Mm-hmm. And you do that in advance because if you're actually in it and it's 1 p.m. and you haven't thought about it in advance, you'll con- you'll convince yourself you're close enough to keep going. Mm. Because we don't like to abandon things, right? Like we have a real bias yeah. against it. it. It feels like it, it might be difficult to kind of know what your kill criteria might be going into a job. So so let's say for our listeners sitting at home or sitting at work who have not come up with their kill criteria to leave a job or a situation, what are some red flags that you should look for in the moment to know that it's time to quit and not too late to quit? What questions should yeah. you be asking yourself? So... What you want to do is kind of like, a, you know, you want to be on a regular basis assessing your situation. So think about what you were hoping for in terms of your own happiness, your own eagerness to do the work, collegiality, fulfillment, maybe like, you know, it could be monetary, like where do you expect it to be in terms of um, compensation? Mm-hmm. What were those things that made you think that this was a good job for you to take in the first place? And then reassess that and do that on a regular basis. So I suggest just like people do quarterly business reviews, you should do a quarterly personal review. And you should say, like, is this still aligning with my values? Am I actually getting where I want to go? Am I enjoying my work? Uh, If I were thinking about taking this job today, would I? Now, that's actually kind of a hard thing to do. So what is really actually even better to do is not to try to say, is this something I would want to start today? Because it's hard for us to think about the world that way. That's just a hard trick for us to do. But instead, when you're doing that like quarterly personal review, say, what am I hoping to see at the end of the next quarter? And it just turns out like 
thinking in advance like mm-hmm. that is easier for us yeah. than thinking in the moment. So um, think about what are the red flags I might see over the next three months. And at that point, you know, you have more information about the situation you're in anyway. So you can predict what those things are. So you have a, a really annoying coworker who doesn't do their job and expects you to clean up after them say if that's still going on in the next three months even if I've talked to my supervisor I've talked to my coworker, and it's still happening and I'm having to do two jobs basically because I'm picking up their slack well that's going to be enough for me to say walk away yeah. and you have to figure out what those things are for yourself mm-hmm. but you should be doing this on a regular basis because we have to remember anything we start is really just like a proxy or a substitute for things we're hoping to achieve and things we're willing to cost ourselves to do it. So it's it's never so, too late to start thinking ahead. Even if you didn't do it, it is the last never quarter, too late. you can do exactly. it today. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it this quarter. That is exactly yes. right. That is exactly it is never too late. I love the practical advice. So before we get into the buzz phrase quiet quitting which has existed for a long time we're just talking about it more now just gave it a different word. <laughs> exactly right. And yeah. it's on TikTok more. That's why we're talking about it. So Let's talk about actually quitting your job. And I've come across at least two different schools of thought. One, quit your job if you don't like it, and then put in your fully committed time to finding the next thing or starting Mm -hmm. a company, whatever you want to do. Or two, on the other side, have something else lined up (laughs) before you quit your job. Have something else that you can walk away to. What is your take on that if, hypothetically, your financial situation is, is not a consideration? Yeah, so I was gonna. My answer is gonna be it depends on your financial situation. Um, so uh, if you're fin- if if you're in a world where the financial situation does doesn't affect you at all, and you're taking into account the risk of a resume gap, which is something that you would want to consider. So let's take those two things out of the equation. Okay. A resume gap isn't gonna hurt you, and financially mm-hmm. you're fine. Then you should quit. And really, honestly, the reason that you should quit is that when you are engaged in something, it it just blocks you from being able to really, truly explore other options. Mm. But also, you may find other things that are more fulfilling, and you're going to be more likely to explore options that are farther away from what you might think. Mm. Right? So you may may actually explore, like, switching functions. You you may be more likely to do that kind of thing. Or you may decide, in the meantime, you want to go get skilled up on something so that you could actually like switch, truly switch your career. And I think one of the best examples of this actually comes from the Great Resignation. Mm -hmm. So we kind of think of the Great Resignation as everybody just quit. (laughs) But that's actually not what happened. What happened was that the people who were specifically furloughed or uh, let go um, or laid off, Mm So the service workers, right? So they were the ones who really got affected at the beginning of the pandemic. People like us who work on Zoom kind of continued on, right? Um, So they got let go. And then when the great reopening happened, when all of a sudden there was lots of employment available, they quit their jobs. Now, they didn't quit them to do nothing. They quit them to go to another position. And the thing that you can surmise there is that they were probably unhappy beforehand, but had that event not occurred, Mm -hmm. where they just thought the cord was cut, they probably wouldn't have explored and found out, like, you know what, I don't really actually like this job that much. I think there's other opportunities for me that I want to go do. So there's something really freeing about not being in something that lets you go and really do true exploration of the space. But again, that's assuming there isn't a monetary issue or a (laughs) resume gap issue. Yeah. I just want to give that big caveat. Definitely. So you can cut the cord for yourself then. If not because of pandemic, if you quit, you If you quit, you that's right. Because sometimes quitting is voluntary. Sometimes it's foisted upon us. And obviously yeah. when it's foisted upon us, we don't get to make a decision about our monetary situation or our resume gap situation. <laughs> yeah. But we can also do it voluntarily. And I think like hopefully you get, you, you'll get the intuition if I say this. Like, Do you think you're going to be ma- – you, do you think you'll make a better choice about your next partner if you look for them while you're in a relationship <laughs> or you look for them Probably after not. you've already left right. a relationship, right? So it's it's true with everything, right? Like that's true of all forms of quitting, whether it's a relationship or a job. You're probably going to do a better job picking if you're not in the other thing. Yeah, it's not going to be good if you're casually swiping through Hinge when you're still in a relationship. No, <laughs> like looking that, there's for the nothing. next best thing. But you know what? That's actually that's actually kind of like relationship quiet quitting. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of the same thing. Yeah, right? you're right. Actually, you know that that 
brings me to another point where even if you're objectively happy in a role doing what you're doing, there's this desire for what's next. What's the next best thing? How can I do even better? How do you quit trying to strive for something else, even though you are happy in your current situation? Yeah, so totally great question. Um, First of all, I think that you should always continue to strive for other things, not because you would necessarily switch, but because your circumstances can change. So you could be super happy in a relationship and then things could change. You could be really, really happy in a job, but then something could happen like a, you know, your leader could leave and somebody new could come in who's mm-hmm. just a jerk, yeah. right? So I think that we want to make sure that we're striving in the sense of like always sort of keeping our eye on the landscape. Like if recruiters are calling, it's okay to have conversations with them. Like not in the sense that you're going to leave, but in the sense that your situation may change. Mm-hmm. I really recommend two things. One is often those those feelings are very uh, transitory, right? Like it's an impulse. Stop and say, ooh, I just had a thought that maybe I'd like to strive for something else. How long do I need to find out that this isn't the place for me anymore, that I really do want to go? And maybe that's three months. And then again, say, what does that look like in three months? Like, let me think about what that is. What could I do to make it better? Could I make this situation better? Or maybe it's just a transitory feeling and I'm just going to stop and take a second and try to figure out like what the, I want this world to look like. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that you can do, though, that I think is really important, and this is a little bit what a parent's role is, is to get someone to help you with the decision. Who's been there, done that, who you really trust, who totally has your back. You know, it could be a mentor, it could be a therapist. Um, and this is kind of like what parents do, right? Like, you hate the piano, and you're saying, I want to quit. And they're sort of helping you to figure out, do you just hate it because you're it's hard right now, <laughs> but it's worthwhile in the long run? And, you know, parents aren't perfect at it, but this is what they're attempting. And I think that's just, like, super helpful is go find someone to help you with the decision. Yeah, yeah. You know, who can, like, either talk you off the ledge or tell you to jump, whichever one it is, right? Yeah. Get someone to help you. On that topic, you talk about enlisting the help of a quitting coach. Yeah. So what quality should this person have and should it be your friend or not your friend (laughs) (laughs) it has to be someone who has your long-term best interest at heart so they they really have to care about how Mm -hmm. things turn out for you (laughs) um and then uh honestly um it a little bit doesn't matter the quality of them except in as much as they love you and they actually their opinion is is worthwhile right Mm -hmm. so if you're asking a friend for stock advice, that's probably bad unless they're, <laughs> unless they're an expert. So you want to make sure that they, their opinion is going to be valuable for the thing that you're asking them about. But other than that, it's actually mostly on you. And in particular, where it's mostly on you is that you have to give them permission to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the problem is that friends tend to want to cheerlead, which is reasonable. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you're complaining about a relationship and, you know, you come back three weeks later and they... They're like, so what happened? And you're like, no, I really think we can work it out, right? Even though they can see there's no way you're going to work it out, they're not going to speak up. Yeah, yeah. They're going to be like, yeah, I'm sure you can work it out, right? So you have, to, you have to give them permission. And you have to say, look, I'm asking you to say some things that you think I'm not going to want to hear. But I do want to hear them even though they're hard because it's going to help me in the long run. And I promise you I'm not going to be mad at you, yeah, right? Yeah. You're, you're my friend for life. It's all good. Right. And that's true of like mentors, too, because mentors also can become cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, therapists are kind of that relationship. When you go to a therapist, you're implicitly giving them permission to really tell you what they see, even if you don't like it. And so that kind of permission giving, that's on you. Right. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, it shouldn't just be like random friend. It should be friend who has a good opinion about the thing you're asking. And then you have to give the person permission and trust that they're going to tell you the truth. Let's say you have a friend who has not given you permission, but they're a good friend, and you see that they're in a situation (laughs) (laughs) situation that they need to get out of, whether it's a job or a toxic relationship. And I only ask because I've had these kinds of conversations in recent history with my friends. In that case, if you haven't been given permission, do you just not say anything? So, uh, yeah, okay. So I wouldn't (laughs) necessarily just, like, bring it up. I try to obliquely probe. 
So how's that job going? <laughs> okay. How's that relationship going? Uh-huh. And then here's the key. If they, th- there's a couple of things you can do. One is when they start saying, oh, it's actually not going well. What do you think? You can actually say, well, I need to understand, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you want me to tell you, like, really what I'm seeing and what my true opinion is? Because, you know, I, I need to know. Or is this something where you're really looking to vent and you're looking for just an ear, like someone to hear what you have to say? Mm-hmm. So you can create that permission by being really clear. What I found is that uh, mostly people actually just kind of want to vent, and that's normally what they'll say to you is, they, I want to vent, and then you accept it. But what I think as a good friend you should do is say, okay, they're venting now, and I recognize they're not going to be in a position to hear what I see, but you can use the kill criteria trick. And you can mm-hmm. say to them, oh, yeah, like this seems like a really bad situation, and you know, I know, like, it really stinks. Like, if, let's say that, you know, in three months you think things are going better. Like, what's going to happen there? Like, are you going to therapy with your partner? Have you have you sat down and had a really hard conversation with leadership at your work? Um, and how do you think things will have changed? And what you can throw in there is, ah, oh, this is such a bad situation. Like, how do you, how long do you think this situation is sustainable for you? Mm-hmm. So now you can kind of get a deadline. Mm-hmm. So let's say they say, like, oh, you know, I think I can only take it for three more months. You're like, oh, yeah, no, I think that's good. Like, three more months, that's really good. So, like, at the end of three months, like, what does that look like? Like, if things if things are better, what does that look like? And if things are worse, what does that look like? And have that conversation with them. And then you can say, so let's chat about it in three months. And generally, that then implies permission to have the discussion in three months. And it's a little bit of a trick to do it. Right. And the thing to realize is that, are they going to be in that situation three mo- months longer than if you were the you know, ultimate ruler of the world? <laughs> sure. But we all know what happens otherwise is they complain to you, and then three months later they complain to you again, and yeah. then three months later yeah. they complain to you again. <laughs> so you're getting them out of it maybe in three months instead of a year. Sure, yeah. And that's huge when, you know, we all have short lives. Like, let's save some time. So you're not imposing your opinion on your friend necessarily. Yeah. You're asking questions such that you're helping them arrive at the inclu- conclusion themselves. Right. And if they happen to give you opinion, you could, you know, sorry, if they happen to give you permission, Mm -hmm. you know, you can give it to them right there. Yeah. But like, I mean, you have to sort of tread lightly on that stuff and understand that in the moment, it's very hard for people to hear that you're telling them that they should walk away. Because again, that's the moment where you go from this thing that I'm doing is failing to now it's failed. Mm -hmm. And we all want to believe that we can turn it around. And so that's fine. So you just say like, how long is this sustainable? Yeah. And then they tell you, and then you say, okay, so what does it look like in that period of time? Let's come back and talk about it. Mm-hmm. And that's going to maintain your friendship, <laughs> but it's also going to get get you to help your friend get there faster. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's talk about some quitters specifically, starting with you, yourself, Annie. You <laughs> were at a crossroads early in your career. You were a graduate student in cognitive psychology, an aspiring academic but you quit academia and turned to professional poker. Why was that? It does sound very useful as a skill, though, in playing poker. <laughs> <laughs> it is really useful as a skill, as it turns out. Um, you know what? That was forced quitting. I, it was kind of a great resignation moment for me. So mm. what happened was I did five years of graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. And just in terms of five years, it means that I did all of my exams. I was already teaching. I was actually on the job market already. And I was about to defend my dissertation. Okay, so, like, this is, like, a real five years. <laughs> wow. This is, like, okay. I'm oh, my at gosh. The end. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. So so then the question is, like, well, what happened? So I've been struggling with um, a pretty chronic stomach illness, and it, it got to be really acute. And at the time, I was thinking, well, I'm just going to go out on the job market, and then hopefully I'll be able to figure out this health issue. Mm-hmm. Um and my body was like, mm, nope, that's not going to happen, as I ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks. So mm-hmm. that happened to be right when I was supposed to be going and interviewing for jobs. And then it became clear that I just, it was a really bad stomach issue. So I had lost like 25 pounds or something like that. So I just mm-hmm. wasn't – it wasn't like I could postpone the job talks. I just kind of had to cancel it for that year mm-hmm. and take a year off from school so that I could try to address what was going on. Um, and when I left school, I needed money. Cause so I was, like, forced to quit, right, because I got sick. Yeah. And then I started exploring. And the thing that I explored was poker. And I started playing it, and I really loved it. And it turned out I had some talent for it. Um, 
And what I was going to do for that year in the meantime before I went back out on the job market ended up being a career for almost two decades. Um, you know, and I think that that's the big lesson from that, right, is like, look, when you're forced to quit for whatever reason, it doesn't always work out well. Mm -hmm. I mean, for sure, right? Like, I'm not wishing that on people. I think that it would be much better if you could voluntarily quit. But there's a lesson in there, which is that causes you to explore other things. And when I was an academic, I knew how to play poker. I had played a little bit of poker, and my brother played poker. It never crossed my mind, ever, <laughs> that this would be a job until I was forced to consider yeah. it as a job. And the then I found something that was amazing for mm -hmm. me, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I get that there's luck involved in that, but there's a lesson involved in that as well. Yeah, and the quitting piece of poker, obviously, is a, is a big part of why you wrote this you, book. Yeah. And you cite one of the biggest differences between most players and the world's best players in poker is how often they quit. So I'm gonna cite mm -hmm. a stat that you have in the book. In Texas Hold'em Poker, after professionals and amateurs peak at the starting cards they're dealt, the pros play fewer than 25% of their hands before other cards hit the table, whereas the amateurs play more than 50%. Why, why is that? Take us real quick into the psychology of a professional poker player. Okay, so, Professional poker players are thinking about two things. The first is, is this hand worthwhile, right? Do I want to play this hand? In other words, if I bet a dollar, do I expect to get returned more than a dollar, mm -hmm. right? Like, is the return on investment positive? So they're thinking about that. And then the other thing they're thinking about is uh, something called opportunity cost, which we've alluded to, which is, uh, if, I pl if I put this money toward this hand, that's money that I can't put toward another hand. And so you're trying to get your money into the best situations possible. And when you're playing a game of Texas Hold'em and there's nine people at the table, you want to make sure that you have a better than average hand, mm -hmm. right? And those are few and far between when there's nine people at the table. So actually, if you think about it, with nine people at the table, 25% of the hands is a lot. So they're saying, like, I'm more skillful than you are, so I'm willing to play, like, more than my fair share of hands because <laughs> I'm way better than you. But if you thought about, like, there's nine people at the table, you should play like one ninth of the time, assuming everybody was equal. But we don't think we are because we're good players, and so we play 25%, partly because we know we're gonna, we're gonna ditch the hand pretty quickly as soon as we find out it's no good. So compare that to amateurs who are playing over 50% of the hands they're dealt, like what is going on? So why, why are they so much worse at ditching their hands? And it's a few reasons. One just has to do with, um, it's really hard to walk away from when you don't know for sure that you had to. So remember, like you've, when you're playing a poker hand, you've invested money in the pot. When you take a job, you've invested time and energy and intellect and you've onboarded and all of these things that you've done. You invest time in relationships, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you invest, invest time waiting in a grocery line. So we're making these investments in these things that we start. And so for a poker player, you've got money in the pot. And if you fold, that's when you're saying, I'm not getting that money back. Now, remember, that's a backward way to think about it because what you want to think is the next dollar that I bet yeah. worthwhile. But it's very hard for people to mm -hmm. say, I'm okay folding and not getting my money back unless they're absolutely sure. So this is something that's just true of quitting is we often won't do it until we just don't have another choice and until the choice is so clear that there's nothing else we can do, right? Like, the relationship is so toxic that you're on hinge looking for other things to do, <laughs> right? Or, you know, the job is so horrible that you're taking all your sick days and you can't get out of bed. And it's, you know, in those cases, it's very clear you should have quit earlier. Yeah. But you're waiting until you're certain. And, and the elite players don't need to wait till they're certain. They're very good at, like, noticing the signs. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I think that's really interesting with amateurs is that it's really hard to fold when there's more cards to come and it may turn out that you, you would have won. The possibilities, yeah. Right. So, and, and what's weird is this turns into an excuse. So somebody will start a company, let's say, and it's not going well, and then they'll always point out to like, oh, but that guy's company was totally on the brink of death, but they kept at it and ended up succeeding. So you, you brought up you know, the, the company example for startup founders who are going through troubling times. It doesn't feel like they're getting any traction with their customer base. They're using up their investor dollars. How do you know if you should persevere and keep pushing and keep trying versus quitting? And, and you have a great example with Stuart Butterfield as an example yeah. of like the quit version of that. But when do you know it's the right time to actually just keep going? So, I mean, I think... 
I think Stuart Butterfield demonstrates both sides of the equation. There's lots of lessons in here. You know, Stuart Butterfield founded uh, his second company, which was called Glitch. Yeah. Um, and he was developing a game called Game Never Ending, which is like this massive online role-playing cooperative world-building game, which was like a huge critic's dar- darling. So it was like Dr. Seuss meets Monty Python. People thought it was a beautiful <laughs> game. They loved it. Um, and they actually had 5,000 diehard users and 6 million in the bank with Andreessen Horowitz and Nacelle having backed them. Um, so they had lots and lots of money in the bank. And, the, you know, they had users, right? But they all kind of had figured out that there was a problem, which is for every user that they got, like 95 people visited the game. or it was my, I think it was more than that. It might have been 99 people. Um, and they played it for seven minutes and left. So in order to get these like diehards who play 20 hours a week or more, you had to get the game in front of a lot of people. So they had only been doing PR, and they decided to do a huge marketing push. And so for the six weeks through sort of October and November of 2012, they do paid marketing. And the users actually grow 6% to 7% month, uh, week over week, rather. So they're, they're really growing users. So on uh, the weekend of November 11th and 12th, they have a really huge weekend. That's sort of the end of this marketing push. And Stuart Butterfield goes to bed, and he can't sleep. He's really, it's restless. And he wakes up the next morning, and he sends a note to his co-founders and his investors saying, I woke up this morning with the dead certainty that Glitch was dead, that it was over. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, what's going on there? Because they're growing users. And this is very poker-like, right? Mm Because things look pretty rosy right now. They've got $6 in the bank, and they they just acquired a lot of users. But he's thinking more like a poker player, and he's like, well... But if we were to maintain this growth, it would take us 31 weeks to break even. And I don't think we can maintain this growth Mm -hmm. because at some point you've saturated the gaming audience, right? So we're not going to be able to maintain it. So it's going to be way more than 31 weeks to break even, at which point he just realized it wasn't a venture scale business. And what was, I think, important about this is one of the things that really concerned him was that his employees were taking basically no cash in exchange for equity. And once he he felt a, like a moral obligation that once he realized the equity wasn't worth their time, he he needed to let them go. Now, notice this is sort of to your point about progress versus being short of the goal. It's turned on its head because most people think I owe it to my employees to keep going. Yeah. And what he realizes, no, I owe it to my employees <laughs> to let them go yeah. because the equity they're working for isn't worth their time. Mm-hmm. And they're brilliant and they should go do something amazing. Mm. So he shut it down. Now, that type of thinking is exactly what tells you when you should keep going because you can do those same types of calculations to figure out when are you going to get to break even, when do you think you're going to get over the hump. Now, going back to that idea of forced quitting or what quitting does for you in terms of exploration, um, once he shuts the company down, literally two days later, he's like, oh, we have an internal communication tool here that we really like around here. We don't have a name for it, but I don't know. Maybe that's the next product. Let me give it a name which was searchable log of all company knowledge, which yeah. is Slack. Slack. <laughs> so he, sort of like me, right? Like I, poker was in my life. I knew about it. I played it. But it, it didn't occur to me to do anything until I was forced to quit. Mm-hmm. For him, until he quits Glitch, he doesn't see that Slack right. is even a thing that he can develop, which I think is a really important lesson there. And the reason why he can do that is because he could look ahead to figure out, is Glitch worth doing or is it not? Mm-hmm. The theme I'm seeing here is always look ahead and don't dwell on what could have been. Don't look backwards. It is about what's happening now and how that's going to impact you in the future. I want to get your take, Annie, on how you quit when the stakes are really high and specifically very public. So let's say your reputation and public embarrassment are on the line. And I'm thinking about two pretty recent high profile examples like Quibi launching and shutting down within the same year and they had raised over $1.75 $1.75 billion. CNN Plus shutting down after a month. They had spent a reported yep. $300 million that they sunk into it. So if you're a high profile company or you're a leader of a high profile company, what is going through your mind <laughs> in these situations yeah. that leads you to quitting as a strategy? So first of all, let me say good for them. Because again, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, they had spent a bunch of money, but were they going to spend a lot more? And I think most people in that situation, particularly when it's high profile, would be unwilling to shut it down mm-hmm. uh, in such a public way. And a lot of the reason is that, um, again, it's super public. And when it's really public, the people who are the decision makers have their uh, identities kind of on the yeah. line. And yeah. it's really hard to quit your own identity. And this is particularly true when you've done something public that is out of the mainstream in some way. Mm -hmm. So you're making a big bet. 
So there's two issues that play together. So the first is called internal validity, which is the desire for us to see ourselves as consistent. I want to be seen as a consistent person. And if I'm changing my mind, then I'm not going to feel like I'm consistent. I'm going to feel like I made mistakes. And then there's external validity, which is how are other people going to view us. What I think is interesting is that we think those two things, we think of them as the same. So the things that we're worried we're going to think about ourselves, we think that other people will think about us. Mm -hmm. But in general, it's actually not so. Mm -hmm. So there were lots of people who thought it was a good idea to shut those companies down, it, regardless of whether you think everybody's going to think you're an idiot. Um, there was a great story that Ken Kamler told me, who was a doctor. He's a doctor who has been a doctor on Everest, like part of the medical team for expeditions climbing. And he was actually trying to summit in 1994. And they were on the Southeast Ridge, which is pretty darn close to the summit. But the climbing with conditions were terrible. Um, and so they all made the decision to turn, da turn around. And what he said was, I just thought the whole time about when I got home, everybody's going to think I was a failure. Like he just had this whole like talk track in his head mm -hmm. about what they were all going to think. And when he got home, everybody's like, oh my God, that was so amazing. I don't think I could have done that. Yeah. Like yeah. how'd you actually turn around? Like mm -hmm. they had the intuition. They were like, that would be really hard. And it turned out people were actually really proud of him. And that was the moment that he said, like, I realized that the goal wasn't to get to the top of the mountain. It was to get, to get, it was to get back down. It sounds like it's a good signal if when you shut something down, you quit something, other people are, like, surprised by it. Like, wow, yeah. that was quick versus waiting. That's a until, very good signal. Yeah, versus it, waiting until people are like, oh, you know, I saw that coming, right? Well, <laughs> and, and in fact, it's usually worse than that, which is if you wait for that, they usually say, oh, yeah, you should have done that a lot earlier. Right, right. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I, I think that's a really good way to think about it, Nora, is, is if people are really surprised – you should be proud of that yeah. because that means that you did something that's hard mm -hmm. that most people can't do is you were willing to quit when other people couldn't see it. Mm. Ooh, I like that. And every time I've quit my jobs, people have been shocked. So the, I, I'm patting myself on the back. That's very affirming for me. Thank you. This is like therapy for <laughs> yeah, you. It is. I love it. I like it. A couple more things before you let you go, Annie. Sure. Uh, we have a fun segment called Shoot Your Shot. So this is where you tell me your wildest ambition, your biggest dream, your moonshot idea. It could be personal or professional. It is your chance to shoot your shot. So go for it. Well, okay. So my moonshot idea is something that I'm actually kind of already doing. Is that okay? Yes, of course. Okay. So I'm co-founder of something called the Alliance for Decision Education. Ooh. And what we're trying to do is get decision education into every K through 12 classroom. So I write about it, right? I wrote Thinking and Bets, How to Decide, Quit. This is the space that I write in. And when you look at books like, like Daniel Kahneman, right, Thinking mm -hmm. Fast and Slow, or Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein with Nudge, or Katie Milkman with How to Change, there's so much work that's done on adult decision making and like what goes wrong and what goes right. But we spend all our time teaching kids like trigonometry. <laughs> Like, why? Like, we should be teaching them <laughs> yeah, to make better decisions, totally. right? Yeah, yeah. So we want to get, like, this field, like, we want to define this field of decision education, get it into every single K through 12 classroom. And it's a total moonshot because, first of all, the education system's really, it's, it's really hard to, like, turn that boat around in, <laughs> or even change directions slightly. Uh -huh. um, it's just really hard. And when you look at, like, other educational movements, like, social emotional learning for example it took 30 years mm -hmm. to get that into classrooms mm -hmm. but aren't we really happy that it's there yeah right yeah so uh this is the definition of a moon threat shot I like I, it's low probability but i think i mean if you think about it right like what's going to change society because individuals in society make decisions and the better the decisions the individual in the society society makes the better those individuals lives are going to be and the better society is going to be so we think it's worth it. Yeah. And we're going for it. And there you go. That's my moonshot. Uh, how I wish that could have been a part of my curriculum. Like, I love trig, but I'd rather learn about decision making. <laughs> well, the thing triangles. is that you can you can learn trig later in life. Yes. If you I'm need not it. sure why we're torturing, <laughs> right. like, you know, ninth graders with trig. <laughs> exactly. Okay, final thing for you, Annie. We have a very quick game. It's called okay. Who Quit What? So I'm going to give you a few clues. And you have to try to guess who the famous quitter is based oh, okay. on those clues. And this is oh, from... Oh, no, I'm going to be so bad at this game. It's totally fine. It is challenging. Okay. I will say that up front. So if okay. you get them all, right. all wrong, I understand because okay. I would have gotten them, gotten them all wrong. So this is from Time's list of famous quitters. Okay, number one. 
Here's your clue. In 1969, after finishing his band's final album, the singer-musician decided to call it quits. While lots of factors contributed to the group's breakup, he was especially miffed when he offered his new song, Cold Turkey, as a potential single to the band, and they didn't want it. He released the song under the name of his new side project. Who is this quitter? 1969. It's a band. I... Is it... No, because that's too late. I was going to say it's Robbie whatever from the band is who I feel like it is, but I don't think that, that that's true because that's too early. Oh, wait, was it Eric Clapton? Uh-uh. Okay, I give up. Th- think of okay. the most famous band in the 60s. In the 60s? Well, it's not the Beatles because they didn't break up before then. It, it, it is the Beatles. It is the Beatles? It is the Beatles. So it's, it, it's John is Lennon it, is the it's person. It's John Lennon? It's John Did they Lennon. break up in 1969? So Lennon broke this decision to his bandmates in September of 1969, though the band's demise wouldn't be confirmed until a couple months later when Paul McCartney delivered the bad news oh, in a okay. Life magazine interview. But I just interview. watched that wonderful documentary, so I'm so sad that I, I thought the Beatles <laughs> broke up in like 1972, so that was my bad. What well, cold we'll turkey sounds this exactly again, like but. a that no 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 I believe you I believe you I'm I'm saying I'm prob- I'm for sure wrong here okay. we do have a fact checker so we'll double check anyway but yeah, yeah. John Lennon is a famous okay. quitter so there you go cold turkey sounds like a song he would write <laughs> yeah, okay it does okay the next one is so hard <laughs> okay. But it's educational. Well, I mean, I failed on the easy one. <laughs> no, no, no. None of them are easy. Okay. This 42-year-old gave up his inherited job for love in 1936. And to this day, he remains the only English sovereign in history. It's the king of England. To um, voluntarily is it Edward? Abdicate. Yes. Wow. Yes. I would have had no idea about this one. I had no idea. Got that one. Okay. Edward VIII. You're a genius. Yeah. Okay. So more info for our listeners. He said this in a televised, televised speech. I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. Okay, final one. This athlete retired at arguably the height of his career in 1993. Barry Sanders. <laughs> no, <laughs> not quite. Oh, but he did, though. Okay. <laughs> this is another one. Uh, okay. e- even more uh, well-known person. Topping okay. the NBA in scoring for seven consecutive seasons and had been named most valuable player three times. Oh, After leading is it his- Michael Jordan? Yes. Then he came back. <laughs> yes. He quit to play baseball, and then he came And then back. he came back. <laughs> and then he quit again in 1990. I got two of them. You are so good, Annie. I oh, would I'm not so have excited. guessed Wait, let's play this game more. <laughs> I don't have any more for you, but you can come back and play, and we can. Just so do a wait, whole the reason why this. I know the reason why I know uh, the Michael Jordan one is because I watched what, what was it the Last Dance? Is that what yep, it's called? Yep. There yep. was a documentary yeah, that came so out during good. COVID yeah. that was so good, so and good. so I thank God for Netflix. That's all I can say because that's <laughs> that's how I know the answer to the last two. But I watched the Beatles thing, so I should have known that answer too. I'll give it to you, Annie. I'm going to call this a three for three because you just you know all the facts, you knew everything, <laughs> so you win this game. Annie, let's leave things there. This was so fun. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. We appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. This is Business Casual, and I'm Nora Ali. You can follow me on Twitter at Nora K. Ali. That's Nora, the letter K, Ali. And I would love to hear from you. If you have ideas for episodes, comments, and thoughts on episodes you loved, fun segment ideas, just shoot me a DM and I will do my very best to respond. You can also reach the BC team by emailing businesscasual at morningbrew.com or call us. That number is 862-295-1135. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to Business Casual on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And if you like the show, please leave a rating and a review. It really Really, really helps us. Business Casual is produced by Catherine Millsop, Olivia Mead, and Raymond Liu. Additional production, sound design, and mixing by Daniel Marcus. Kate Brandt is our fact checker, and AB Silver is our senior booking producer. Sebastian Vega edits our videos. Our VP of multimedia is Sarah Singer. Music in this episode from Daniel Marcus and the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Thanks for listening to Business Casual. I'm Nora Ali. Keep it business and keep it casual. Business Casual. If you like what you saw and you like what you heard, you can listen to the entire episode of this podcast, Business Casual, anywhere you get your podcasts. And please go ahead and subscribe to the Morning Brew YouTube channel and go ahead and click on that alarm bell, that thing right there, so you can be alerted anytime there's a new video.